So what's the big deal about defining expectations and directing people towards the desired outcome? Like, why is it so challenging for leaders in this day and age? Like, aren't leaders just supposed to set the course for employees to follow? Do they really have to manage their employees' emotions and let them do what it is that the employees want so they don't get upset? Well, it seems like it. Is it any wonder that there is a lack of accountability in most organizations these days? Stay tuned as we offer insights into why leaders avoid defining and directing performance, teams, and organizational processes. Welcome to Dismantling Dysfunction, a podcast series for anyone who is ready to eliminate the dysfunction they experience in their organizations, leaders, or relationships. Each week, we explore common dysfunctions in organizations, delving into the systemic causes behind them and giving you the exact tools and practical tips you need to dismantle them. Now, here are your hosts, organizational development and behavioral change experts, Dr. Anne Dranitzaris and Heather Dranitzaris Hilliard. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are continuing our series on accountability. Anna and I love talking about the dysfunction of accountability in organizations and how it almost feels like it's become an epidemic. And if you caught it in our last episode, we discussed the need for leaders to develop their emotional intelligence so that they don't let fear get in the way of doing their job, right? Which is all about fostering accountability. And we highlighted a bunch of ways in which leaders' fears and their fixed beliefs, those stories they tell themselves, stop them from taking the time to get into detailing expectations and providing direction. We also reinforce the importance of leaders being self-aware enough to know when they are avoiding difficult conversations um, and not working through employee resistance. We started chatting, if you uh, caught it, or if you haven't, love to have you go back and check it out. We started chatting about the actions that uh, that leaders need to use in the accountability cycle. And we started first a little, talking a little bit about the first action, which is what we're going to be covering off today. So that's about defining. So today we're going to continue this discussion on this one leadership approach or action that is critical for what we call the planning for success stage of the accountability cycle and its complementary actions directing. But before we continue, make sure you hit the button to subscribe or turn on your notifications. If you're catching us on the audio, don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast to make sure that you stay updated with our latest leadership videos and podcasts. And don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you find it valuable. So with all that being said, right, let's jump into talking about the epidemic of a lack of accountability in organizations. Thanks for the great intro, Heather. You you always inspire me because every time you introduce this topic of accountability, so many things go through my head. But before I start with one of them, a big hello to everyone tuning into our podcast. We appreciate every one of you joining our audience. Heather, I, I just, as you're talking, I'm thinking how astounding it is that leaders don't feel comfortable defining employee expectations or processes. It's as though they believe that they're taking something away from their employees by defining what needs to be done, right? Have have we forgotten collectively that this is actually the leader's job? Seems like it, doesn't it? And it's equally alarming to see many leaders opting to abdicate these essential elements of their role being permissive instead and contributing without really thinking about what they're doing to the collective, contributing to that lack of accountability. They must believe they they make their employees happy by letting them do their own thing. There's no other reason why they wouldn't be, be doing it. The intention to be amiable and empathetic is really, it's really important. Still, there's a stark difference between being a supportive leader and one who shirks their responsibility. Yeah, I love this this first piece, right, of leaders are around the defining. And, you know, so many of our clients where we'll go in and we'll talk to the leaders and, you know, we'll talk to their direct reports. And some of these direct reports are senior leaders in the organization. And, and we know this is one of the places, this lack of defining, right, that, that is 
creating a gap. And it's like the leader will come and say, hey, I've got this ask, right? And, and the ask has no definition around it. It's just an ask. And one of our clients, we've used this example. And so if you're from that client, you can probably chuckle where we've heard it. But one of the senior leaders will say, you know, I don't want us to be bureaucratic. And, and which is like, you know, in his mind, he is defining an expectation that everybody should follow, but there's no definition to it, right? It's just, this is sort of, a, as we start to stretch that somehow leaders are, are mistakenly thinking that, well, if I just say something, everyone's just gonna know all of the things that are involved in that. And what's really interesting in that absence of definition, um, that, that there's no ability to then follow up to when things are misaligned, because really what they're misaligned to this void that they've created by putting that ask into it. And, and because leaders aren't doing a good job up front with any of that defining, it also adds to that dread they have about holding others accountable. You know, so we've got the complexity of, well, what am I holding them accountable to combined with that fear of, well, I'm going to be seen as being mean or unsupportive or, you know, I, they should just be able to figure it out. And, and, and that's what they need to be empowered, right? I love that word empowered gets thrown around all the time, right? Yeah. But in its true essence, if you think really think about accountability, it's actually a continuous process and there's, you know, starts and steps that need to be repeated all along the way. It's a cycle and it really does encompass some really specific leadership practices or leadership approaches that ensure that outcomes are actually achieved, not only in a timely fashion, but that are aligned with what the original expectation or requirement was from the organization. Uh, when we talk about defining and, and directing, it really is from a leadership perspective, being able to say, this is exactly what I want. This is what success looks like. And here's the path that we're going to follow in order to be able to achieve that. It's providing a level of absolute clarity before you why we call it planning for success so that everybody doesn't end up scrambling or pointing fingers or being confused later on in the process. So again, I like to think of defining and, and directing as a way of getting that preemptive clarity so that we're avoiding mistakes, we're avoiding any embarrassment when things go south, we're not really having defined that those, what it is that we are actually looking for from our folks before they move into taking action. It's a great individual example that, that you gave uh, uh, around a, your client. And another um, an, another client example is the, the manager who goes and says, um, do you have time to do this for me? Or um, I need this done without saying when or why. And, and not thinking how important clarity is. And, you know, in, in this cycle, the accountability cycle, the process is actually really clear cut. It's not a one time event. It's not a, a character trait when we're talking about accountability. It is this process where leaders set expectations and guide their employees toward their goal. But, you know, Heather, it baffles me. Why don't more leaders do this? It's, it's like they're setting everybody up for success. And, and, inadvertently they're saying um i'm going to empower you by not telling you what i want when i want it or whether it's a priority or it's important and you go away and be successful at doing all of those really big things that i just communicated and i came across this astonishing statistic there's lots of these flying around about accountability and giving expectations, nearly 60 to 70% of employees feel that their leaders aren't clear with their expectations. That's way more than half the workforce. Yeah, and I, I mean, we can back that up with our own experiences with our clients, right? And, and even the number of clients where a big part of the work that we're often doing in our client organizations is putting definition and direction to what it is that they need as leaders, be that 
from you know sort of at a collective level uh, in terms of some of the processes and systems or at an individual level and i you know i can't tell you the number of uh, leaders that we've worked with including senior leaders where when we talk about well what do you need from that role or what do you need from that function and it's always like well the leader there knows or the incumbent knows and it, as though again it's sort of this magical thing so i think you're right it's like it's like, why? Like, why are leaders so resistant to define? Like, I, I understand the resistance to the confronting at the back end, but, you know, that that absolute absence of that upfront defining as though I'm too afraid to tell you what it is that the business needs in from you or from you as a collective in this particular situation, as though, I don't know, maybe is it as though who am I as a leader to tell you what needs to happen? So we get all of this sort of backward communication. And it's interesting, there's some Gallup research that backs this up even further, where only about 50% of employees actually grasp what it is that's expected of them. So no wonder we have this accountability a lack of accountability or accountability dysfunction epidemic because you you think 50 percent half of your organization have no idea what's expected of them um and so how can we get to the, that particular outcome harvard business review same thing they currently talking about lack of clarity and roles and expectations as a, a recurring challenge and it, so so leaders and, and and we talk about accountability and i just want to clear but clarify this before i pass it back over to Anne. is like we're not just talking about accountability at that between the direct manager and the employee like we're talking about accountability across the organization where there is an absence of defining defining who's responsible for what who gets to make what decisions what the standards are like that's all part of defining in that space of, of really fostering a culture of accountability and and so we see it at that micro level of i'm not going to tell my employee what it is I, I really want or need from them because you know again sometimes i'm too afraid or i can't tell them to do that but it's also at that broader macro level organizationally where it's sort of like everyone's trying to figure it out as they go and nobody is stepping in and saying yes no like this not like that this is what success looks like um, I, I was just talking to to a client um, earl, earlier today who's going into a new VP role, and and I said, so do you have some questions that you're going to ask your your boss now about what she expects from you? And she said, oh, I can't possibly do that. And I said, well, if why not? Oh well, she'll think that I'm stupid and I don't know what I'm doing. I said, but you've never done this job before. And, and this is where, you know, senior leaders with it, this way of thinking that I have a new job, but nobody should tell me what they expect of me because I'm at such a high level that I don't need anything I should already know. And, and so you can see how with accountability, this all starts at the top in most organizations where the culture is fractured with some people you know, really embodying it using the accountability cycle and other leaders just basically avoiding defining and directing performance. You know, and, and it's it's both an, a mix of internal and external pressures that cause this. And the first thing I've encountered with so many of our clients is this fear and of confrontation or resistance that, that they're afraid that performance correction or even setting expectations is somehow offensive to their employees and that setting cl clear expectations and direction might be an affront to someone's to an employee's ego you know why are you telling me this don't you think i know what i'm doing that that sort of behavior and because a lot of leaders they just don't have the interpersonal skills or the emotional intelligence as we talked about last time they go into avoidance and the the fears that we talked about as well the the apprehension isn't just about being appearing strict or auto, autocratic it's the emotional and psychological toll that perceived confrontations can take and <clears throat> excuse me, leaders also worry about tarnishing their relationships with team members, concerned that pushing for clarity might breed resentment. Again, it's looking at how we, we as leaders, we, we start to put 
feelings before outcome and before performance and before clarity, sub subjectivity before objectivity. And taking care of people's feelings starts to impede the leader's ability to set expectations and direct their people. And instead of learning non-defensive communication skills, instead of saying, hey, I really don't do a particularly good job in these interpersonal conversations. How do I get better at it? They avoid it at all costs. They do avoid defining and directing their employees instead. Yeah, it's, it's it, you know, and I don't think people talk about it. And I know even for us, like we, we've, we you know, we're trying to have even clearer conversations and be more definitive around what's involved in accountability than, than we ever have before with some of our leadership clients. Because you're right, it's like if you don't see these discrete things and see defining and directing as this activity, this leadership approach that you must do, and then you're going to avoid it. But then add to it if you've never had the skills. And, you know, and we, as we were talking about this, that, you know, that resistance that we see all the time in leaders to, to go into this place around defining and directing, which of course is, you know, working out of our executive functioning, right? Is like, what's the goal? Where do I want to get to? What does it look like when we're there? Um, and instead, what we see a lot that goes on in organizations, especially where there's a lack of accountability, is more of that complaining and blaming, right? Or I can talk about what I don't like. I can, I can think, I'm thinking about a client right now who always tells the story of, they tell me to go do something and I do it. And then I, that I bring it back and they tell me I've done it wrong or, or it's too much here or too much there because I don't get any of that information up front. And that's all part of that defining. And when leaders have not been developed, if they don't understand and I had the proper training to understand what does it look like to define things up front so people can actually follow and execute against it? What does it look like to direct it, to provide that level of more detailed direction of, you know, the when, the who, the how, the resources, you know, the check-in all of those sorts of things, um, then of course, we're going to have this, the, these challenges. And, you know, leadership is, you know, obviously about more than just interpersonal skills, there's this element of strategic oversight. But if I'm afraid, if fundamentally, I'm afraid, or I'm not skilled or equipped to actually go, well, what is it that I need? And what does success look like, then I am actually end up finding myself following what it is that my employees are doing and reacting and respond to, responding to it, which means I'm actually behind them as opposed to leading them out front as, as we should be as our leaders, right? So we know not every leader has had training in dealing with resistance or effective communication. And as you said, Anne, that not the non-defensive communication skills, but, but it's even looking at a lot of other leaders that we worked with, they have never been taught in part because they haven't necessarily been in a situation where they've got leaders who are doing it themselves. They haven't really ever been taught these defining and directing approaches that are so fundamental and they'll give information or they'll give an ask or they'll, you know, talk about what they don't want, but really sitting there to articulate and feel comfortable and confident in that articulation of what they do want is also a little bit scary, right? Because again, it's like, who am I? Like I'm the leader. I'm supposed to be out there defining these things, but leaders have, you know, sort of pulled back and they haven't been doing it to that same degree. And again, they feel ill-equipped and I understand that. I think, you know, we hear leaders too talk about that. Well, am I, do I have permission to do that? Am I allowed to do that? Because somewhere along the way it, it got pulled out of the notion of that is a core function of a leader is to define and direct what's happening organizationally, uh, functionally, and from a team and from an employee perspective. Um, and again, they that, that fear creeps in because when we don't have the skills, we start to second guess it and say, well, you know, should I be doing that? Because we're pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone to do something where we're not feeling skilled or confident. And am, am I going to do more harm? Are they going to be upset with me? And I, I'm going to share one more experience before I pass it over to you. And, and you know this one well. We have a client where... Um, they have not defined how it is that they want or what they want from the function of their executive assistants. And if you've listened to our podcast before, you've probably heard us use this example because it is such a great one. So as a result of that, every executive assistant in their organization does something completely different. And, and it's not working because they're often complaining as leaders that they don't have the support, they don't have what they need. But the gap is not 
the, the fault of the employees in this case is the leaders there not knowing how to define it, what to define, but also being too afraid to put definition there in case the employees get upset as a result of it, right? You know, as you're talking, Heather, it's there are just so many things that contribute to the reasons behind why leaders will avoid doing this. And and I, I recall a, a workshop with leaders. I was doing a um, leadership 101 program and and it was a, a workshop on delegating. And I was teaching the leaders how to use a delegation worksheet so that they could clearly define what the task was that they were delegating, you know, what the employee might need, what resources, when, when the task needed to be done by, what kind of oversight. And one of the leaders piped up and said, I'm not using this thing. This is going to take me way too much time. I'll just tell him to do it and he'll go away and do it. And of course, heads around the table were nodding. And so you see the sort of resistance that it sounds like common sense. It sounds so objective when somebody comes up and says something like that. But this is a protective mechanism. They don't want to take the time to do something that they don't feel fully competent about. And so what they'll do instead is they'll convince themselves that they're actually giving their employees more autonomy to do the job the way they think they should do it and think that they're empowering their people and then they get the finished product. It isn't what they want. And we all have self a self-protective mechanism like this. Who likes to look incompetent? Who likes to practice something that you're not naturally good at? But the fallout from not doing something as simple as defining a task that you're going to be delegating and putting it on paper to make sure that the employee is successful at doing it, you run into all kinds of other issues and even in including demotivating your employee. And so this is where leaders who think that they're accountable and that they model accountability in everything they do, they're not taking responsibility for this very crucial people leadership aspect of their role. And so they really do convince themselves the act of defining and directing is unnecessary. Employees should know what to do. That's that famous word Heather and I, we always laugh at, right? Uh -huh. What a mess they make with this type of rationalization because then it comes back to them and they end up having to do it themselves all over again. Right. And, 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 you know, you're so right. And, and this is why in our accountability programs and, um, and the, the leadership work we do in our organizations, that's one of the questions we always ask is, do you ever have an issue where what you get back is not what you were expecting? Okay, there we go. There's a gap in defining and directing because every single leader puts up their hand. I put up my hand. I mean, it took me a long time to get to really get better at this defining and directing. And, and our staff will tell you that when I'm tired or when I'm really pushed in multiple directions, I, I tend to have a bit of a decline on it, right? Because it's you have to pause. And that's sometimes leaders too, I'm mean, not to make excuses for them, but you know, running so fast, running in so many directions, everything is so reactive. And what we're talking about here is that is so fundamental to fostering accountability is taking that time up front, right? And because they do, they all say, oh, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Well, I'm t I tell you, it takes you 10 times at the end to fix all the things that go wrong than it does if you'd slow down enough to put some more definition. And the, the fascinating part about it is, of course, like anything else, the more you exercise this muscle around defining and directing, the easier it comes, the faster you get at it. And it just becomes automatic, like driving, right? Like you don't think about all the different pieces to driving, you know, eventually, but it, that resistance to going in and, and, you know, we know leaders have lots of things to juggle, lots of deadlines, lots of responsibility, but 
it, it's like you get things done through people, which means you're constantly in a state of defining and directing. So getting really good at it, being very effective at it um, so that you're doing it in a way that people can follow, that they can execute and they can deliver in a way that actually meets and matches those expectations. That's the real fundamental priority for leaders, right? Again, you know, we hear it all the time, right, Anne? Like, I'm too busy. I'm so busy. I don't have time. I don't have time to direct my staff. Oh, you don't have time to be a leader. So, you know, we know it's we know it's a challenge. We also know that one of the things that if a leader understands this piece of the the approach and the accountability process, employees start to understand what to ask for to make sure that they have the right definition given to them and the right direction. And, and so it works both ways, right? But it, it's it, you, what we're trying to do is close that gap that then ultimately leads to what people say as a, you know, a lack of accountability in from an organizational perspective. The, you know, when we look at the, um, you know, the role of the leaders, when they're neglecting this defining and directing part, they're really essentially skipping a crucial part of the leadership process. And it doesn't just affect employee performance. Like I, we link this, Anne, all the time to all of these other dysfunctions that we've talked about throughout our podcast, the dysfunction of chaos, the dysfunction of silos, right? You know, fundamentally, it's this misalignment. Um, you know, the, 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 where we've got people working in their own little bubbles, right? Because there's an absence of definition. We have clients where, um, they have, I think of one, one client where they, they've got something really fundamental to their business from a cash flow perspective, but because the leaders have not come out and been really definitive around the expectation of it, people continue not to do what they need to do in support of the success of the business, right? So, so these aren't, again, I just, as Anna and I talk about all of this, we're not just talking about it at that, you know, you've got one employee and you're struggling with it. We're talking about the way this lack of accountability in organization actually causes a whole bunch of symptoms of dysfunction and they get resolved when the leaders actually start working at and understanding their role in the accountability process and they start doing the different things that need to be done, of course, starting with defining and directing. Really well said, Heather. And I think it's a perfect time to drop our gem for the podcast on that note. This is a time where we provide you with some insight that you can take away and begin to work with. And today's gem has to do with changing how you think about accountability. So, most people think about accountability as an afterthought, a confrontation or a reactionary, um, a confrontational measure that they use when things are done wrong. But it's a proactive mindset, a continuous process that infuses every phase of a task or project. So, so the gem is around really getting it from being a singular into a holistic concept, a cycle, a system, something again that permeates every process and every person in your organization. True accountability is grounded in setting clear expectations and directing one's team toward those goals. And when leaders avoid the essential acts of defining and directing, whether out of fear, lack of training, or misplaced priorities, think about this. They not only hinder their team's potential, but also deviate from the core essence of leadership. Leadership is not something we do off the side of our desk. Leaders are professionals. This lapse by not doing it not only affects performance, but reshapes the organizational culture. So, so think about it and reflect on your definition. What does accountability mean to you? And see if you are harboring a fixed mindset that limits your thinking and equating it with your performance management system, for example, or something that you do at the end of a task or activity. Yeah, my favorite around this one, when you think about the fixed mindset is, of course, I'm accountable. End of conversation, right? <laughs> like, it's just this one thing, right? Yeah, of course, my people are accountable. No, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> So again, if you happen to be experiencing the kinds of challenges that we're talking around, around these accountability gaps, and again, 
thinking about all of those, some of those different organizational dysfunctions that tie back into this absence of the accountability culture. Uh, we definitely have a solution and we have designed our ultimate accountability experience program just for leadership teams who are ready now to strengthen up their ability and their culture, uh, organization's culture to one that really, really, truly is a culture of accountability. So it is a series of two hour workshops that we are execute and work closely with your leadership team over a period of time to really embed these accountability practices into your organization and build the skills and the emotional intelligence of your leaders. So some really deep foundational concepts each workshop is a stepping stone that moves further into understanding and being able to lead for accountability and demonstrate the core accountability leadership approaches that we talk to. So we break it down. We break accountability down in a way that leaders can actually do it, can action it, and can follow through on it, which we know is a real challenge. And after all of these years of working with leaders, we are so excited with being able to come up and work with clients in a way that really allows the leaders to move quickly in shifting accountability practices inside the organization. So if you want to check out and learn more, we have a free live webinar coming up called Why Leaders Avoid Fostering Accountability. We're going to talk about the five mistakes leaders make and the exact blueprint that you can bring into your organization to make that transition. I would say in times like this of economic uncertainty, quiet, quick, quitting, quitting while we still have employee entitlement, there is no better time to develop up your leaders to be able to lead for accountability than right now. So make sure, check out the link that's there on your screen if you're watching us, um, catching us live or watching our video. Um, and we will make sure it's there in the podcast notes if you're checking us out on the um, uh, on the audio podcast version. So that's a wrap for this episode of Dismantling Dysfunction. As always, we're your hosts, Heather Dranit Saris Hilliard and myself, Dr. Ann Dranit Saris, committed to supporting leaders in today's challenging work environment helping them develop leadership behaviors that contribute to a thriving organization. It's all, it's what we all need and want, isn't it? Thanks for listening and join us again for our next episode where we explore another important action for leaders required for accountability. We introduce you to the action of correcting when employees, colleagues, and others are misaligned with expectations. We hope you'll join us as we help leaders empower themselves to be accountable for themselves, the performance of their employees, their functional area, everywhere, all with more stories and adventures of our lives in the world of dismantling dysfunctions. Yeah, and I echo Anne's comments. Thank you all so much for investing your valuable time to listen or to watch us if you're catching us live um, or on the video to gain insights into the competencies that leaders need to master this stage of setting people up for success, moving towards alignment and accountability in your organization. If you find this information valuable, we really appreciate you giving us a thumbs up or sharing, sharing it with other leaders that you know or that are in your organization who can benefit from the content. Always just a reminder, follow us on our LinkedIn pages, turn on notifications if you're catching us on YouTube so that you never miss a live video or an updated video. And we hope that you stay tuned for our upcoming uh, LinkedIn live sessions where you'll gain more valuable knowledge to enhance your leadership journey as we continue to dismantle dysfunction together. If you missed the live session, don't worry. You can catch the video on our YouTube channel. We've got everything covered for, for everybody. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you're updated whenever we release new videos. We also release all of our recordings on various po podcast platforms. So be sure to subscribe on your favorite platform to never miss an episode. We are on a mission to hit a, per, a particular target for ourselves. So, so that's why please, please, please subscribe. <laughs> Until next time, embrace accountability and become the leader your team deserves. Remember, true leadership does begin with self-accountability. See you in the next video. Thank you for listening to the Dismantling Dysfunction podcast with Dr. Andra Anitzaris and Heather Dranitzaris-Hilliard, organizational development and behavioral change experts. 
Be sure to subscribe to get more practical insights and focused tools to help you dismantle dysfunction in your organizations, leaders, or relationships. For more information, visit dismantlingdysfunction.com.